Sorry, you're at Live Office Hours with Andy LaCivita. We're at 11.30 a.m. Central for the next handful of Thursdays. I'm going to be giving career and job search advice and taking your questions. And today we're going to be talking about the why do you want to work here question. And I'll take whatever else you want to, to run over. I just want to introduce myself quickly. My name's Andy LaCivita. I'm the founder of Mile Walk and the Mile Walk Academy and the award-winning author of The Hiring Prophecies. And I've made it my mission in life to help people succeed in their careers. And I've done that through my executive search for Mile Walk, which I started in 2004. And I do an awful lot of that now through the Mile Walk Academy, which is my training site where I teach on three topics, everything careers related and personal development for individuals and hiring for companies. Now, all of that information, the sites, the blog, my contact info, my links to the social sites, all that stuff is in the description of the live stream. And also in the description of the live stream, as a thanks for stopping by, I've got two great giveaways to help you with your job interviewing. The of Teaching webinar, it's a job interviewing webinar called Three Keys to Ace Any Job Interview. It's been running for three or four months now. Uh, we're having a ball with it. It's extremely popular. It's everything you'd want to know about how to answer and ask questions in a job interview. So I hope you I hope you check those out. You can check them out now. You can check them out later. They'll be in the link and the recording of this as well. So you can always you can always grab that later. So I just want to make one good check. Are we still care? It looks like the stream health is good. So I just want to make sure before I before I dive into how I would handle this question. Now, last week, for any of you that were here last week, you know I absolutely loathe, I hate the tell me about yourself question. But, but this particular question that we're gonna talk about this week, why do you wanna work for our company or why do you wanna come here or something of that nature is a fantastic question. I think every employer should ask it and I think every job candidate in some way or another should be required to answer it. It's a great question. But the problem, there's a, there's two real problems with this question. It has more to do with the nature of the question rather than it being a bad question itself. So think about think about what happens. And I know a lot of you've been in job interviews. This is, in my opinion, one of the three or four questions that you should always be asked in an interview. And a lot of times it comes out early. You know, you get the, hey, why do you want to leave your company? Or why did you leave your company? Why do you want to come here? What's unique about you? Those kind of questions, they typically come out really early in the interviewing process. Usually it should be the second or third question that somebody asks you. But think about just by the nature of the question, it's designed to get you to start talking about what's great about the company, right? What, what, why would, what do you think is so great about us that you'd want to come and work here? That's basically what they're asking you. But this isn't a, it about them. And it, it's especially not about them in the beginning of the interview when it should be about you selling yourself and making sure that you are setting the tempo for how the interview is going to go. And you can't do that by spending a lot of time telling them how great they are. And that's actually what they expect you to do. Most job candidates simply get this wrong right out of the chute because they go where the question is naturally designed to take them. But I don't want you to do that. So what I would prefer that you do is talk about you in the context of that question. So something like when the job interviewer asks you, hey, you know, Jane Doe, why do you want to come and work here? I'd rather you say something like, I have 10 reasons why I think I want to work here. Because you think at this point you don't know. You've just done some research. So I have 10 reasons why I think I want to work here. And before I dive right into those 10, I'd love to spend 30 seconds and explain to you how I came up with them. You know, before I started to interview for a job, I sat down, I wrote out 20 different criteria that I wanted to evaluate in my next employer to make sure that they were a good fit for me so that I, I truly would be happy. But my time is valuable, as is yours, and I don't want to waste anybody's time. So what I also decided was that through my research, I wouldn't even apply or go in for a job interview unless a company, at least through my research, looked like they could satisfy my top 10 criteria. So I've got 10 of them. I ranked them in order, and through my research, it, 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 it looks like you satisfy these, so let me tell you what they are. 
Number one, the company has to have good, strong corporate financials. Number two, it has to have a product and a service that I believe in. Number three, it's got to be a market leader in its space. You're the, you're the number two organization in this market. Number four, it has, there has to be career development opportunities for me. It looks like from the job description that this is really going to be an opportunity for me to grow in some areas that I'm interested in. The, number five, the employees need, need to be happy and, and want to support the organization and enjoy working there. So those video testimonials that I reviewed on your website where you had the employees talking about what they were doing and the corporate evaluation sites like Wetfeet, Vault, and Glassdoor, you had glowing reviews. Plus I did some recon with people I knew in the market who were familiar with your company. It sounds like employees are really Really happy. Boom. Number six, seven, eight, and on you go. So you are giving them a rapid fire listing of what it is that you've done. And if, and as a bonus, after you get through, if they interrupt you along the way, what you can say, if you can get some insight into who you're going to be interviewing with, if you actually know the interviewer's name, because it's common, and it's really easy to get insight on people, if you do a little recon on the people you're going to be interviewing with, if they interrupt you, or at the end of that say, hey, and actually as one other thing, when I found out I was going to be interviewing with you, I looked you up and I noticed that, I found this interesting, and I couldn't wait to talk to you about it. Now you've personalized it. You've shrunk the company down to that person, if you can. But think about what that style of answer does. You just sold you in the context of them. And that's what you need to be doing at every stage of the interview, but especially in the beginning where you're trying to set that tone and you're trying to get them into a welcoming posture of you. So think about that. Here's what you just said. I respect your time and my own. I am very self-aware. I've identified the things that make me happy. I'm going to inter evaluate them in the interviewing process. And if you give me an offer and I accept it, when I come to work here, you are not going to have to worry for one second that I'm going to be an unhappy employee because I know what I'm doing because I made a good evaluation and I made a good decision. I'm well researched. I'm resourceful. I'm organized. I'm thorough. I'm basically awesome. Who would not want to hire that person? That's what you did. You, you scored a bunch of points in three minutes when you were supposed to be talking about them, and you did, but you put it in the context of how what they seem to offer through your research aligns to what it is that you want. You've also now given them 10 points that they know they need to cover or answer or clarify throughout the interview. And the other thing is, your 10 items are your 10 items. They don't have to be the five examples I just gave. They're, they can be yours, whatever, whatever's important to you, and it depends on your position, it depends on your level, it depends on your industry, and, and so on. But here's the other thing. You don't even have to be right. You don't even, your research doesn't even have to be accurate. It just needs to be mentioned because that's what part of the interviewing process is about. It's about you evaluating what you suspect and why you were interested in the first place. So now you've sold yourself, you've given them insight that they can use to know that they've got some questions that are gonna be coming from you because you're gonna be interested in investigating those top 10 and, and or top 20 or whatever it is that you have. And trust me when I tell you, it is not difficult to come up with 10 items. It really isn't. It might be a little more difficult to research all 10 of, of them, but it's not difficult to come up with those 10. So, and, and I've got a lot of aids on my blog and things like that that are um, actually one thing that I should mention, if you haven't seen it, and it's a post I had quite a long time ago, and I don't think it has a video that accompanies it, but I wrote a, a, an article about uh, the top 12 happiness factors for employees. Go pick those 12 if you're, if you're at a loss for things you should be evaluating. But that's, that's one thing that you certainly can do. I also have some videos and some other things and workbooks that, that help you work through these kind of things as well. So, so that's how I would answer the question. So it's about setting yourself up, introducing what you've done, the fact that you have a number of reasons, you run through them, and you share how you gathered that data or where you got that data. You know, If they're a publicly held company, you can get their corporate financials in their 10K. If they're privately held, you might have to do a little more uh, you might have to do a little more digging. Sorry, folks, I'm still just checking to make sure we're all good on the on the stream. But I hope I hope that helps. I uh, I know we're about we're about what 15 minutes in now, thanks to our little technical difficulties. I am happy 
to take some of your questions, whether they're related to this, uh, this topic or anything on your career or, or job search. So let me see, uh, Pamela, I see some, I see some responses here. Sorry, folks. I'm just looking through the, uh, I'm just looking through the listing here. Kara, help me out. Where, uh, where should I be starting? Larry, hey, Larry. David, great to see you. Ajay, Rob, Rob's a link. Good to see you. Shaheen, Sasha, great to see you, buddy. Jesus, Leo, Pedro, Kara's here. Lori's here. Mariano, Radice. Oh man, there's a whole bunch of you. Okay. Well, let me let me have at it, man. I you you the floor is yours. Here we go. Questions. I don't know, last week's crowd had about a half an hour of questions for me. You guys, hey man, I just had my first cup of coffee five minutes before this session. If anybody should be tired, it should be me. You see, nothing? I can't believe that. Pamela says, I love this. Thank you. Andrew is wonderful. and Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Winda. Okay, Michael Seberger. Clive, Pamela. All right, let me, okay, good. All right, so Michael got us rolling. Michael, great to hear from you. Michael asked, is there an effective way to push the pace with hiring companies without being pushy? That is a fantastic question and for for everybody out there, and I know you're all at, you all have different types of job functions and you have different positions and you work in different industries and all that good stuff. One thing you all have in common, is, generally speaking, is that companies don't simply move fast enough even when they're in a hurry to hire. I, I, know, I know what Michael is getting at here. So here are some, some rules of thumb on timing and pushing organizations along. The first thing is, one thing that you should do, so you, you are in an interviewing pro, let's assume you are, and Michael, I, I know you didn't mention this, but I'm assuming that you are in an interviewing process, meaning you've had an interview and you want to hear back from them and you want to move to the next stage and so on. I know some of you could be submitting, if you're submitting your resumes and you're not hearing back from them, that's a whole different issue. But let's just say for sake of argument, Michael, and you can clarify this for me, that I'm making an assumption that you've had a job interview and you want to move it along. So if you've had a job interview, the first thing that you should do to make sure you start setting the pace for what you can control is the thank you email and card that you should send them. So the first thing to do is when you leave the job interview, if you can, but you, always, you can't always do this, is try to get an idea of what the next step is. So where do we go from here? What would be next? Now, sometimes you're interviewing with a job interviewer who actually can answer that question, and sometimes you're not interviewing with an, a person who can answer that question. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna see if you can get some timing from them. We'll get back to you tomorrow. We'll get back to you next week. We're in the middle of interviewing some candidates. We're not sure when we'll get back to you. So there's any one of, of, of a number of variations. But the thing you can control is asking them to see if you can get that insight and sending them a thank you email and mention you're looking forward to hearing from them. You should send the thank you email within 24 hours and now you've got some dialogue going. By the way, I have a whole host of videos on how to thank the employer. So I'm not gonna get into any detail on that because I wanna talk about the pace that, he, that Michael asked about. So send the thank you email within 24 hours. Now you've continued the dialogue, hopefully they will respond to you with some type of disposition that, hey, you'll be hearing back from us soon. No matter what, no matter what, if they have not told you or you've not heard a response from your thank you or anything of that nature, seven days is the magic number. Seven calendar days. If you have not heard from the company within one week, whether they've told you that you're gonna hear from them or whether they have said nothing. It is appropriate for you to send a message to your main contact and ask for an update. Seven days, unless they say to you, it's gonna be three weeks or it's gonna be two weeks. But if they say anything seven days or less, 
you should email them or contact them within seven days. I would not call them. I would email them first. That's what I would do. So that's one thing that you can control. So everybody, keep in mind, if you don't have any idea of when they're supposed to contact you, seven days, seven calendar days, that includes the weekend, is long enough to wait. If they say they're going to contact you in a week and they don't, then 10 days is the magic number. So you want to look for a cue from them, see if they're going to give you some kind of response. If they do not, then a week is appropriate. If they tell you a week, give them a few extra days, 10 days. If they say it'll be a week to 10 days, give them 12 to 14 days, you know, that kind of stuff. But I would certainly reach in. You are not being pushy if you send them a message asking and expressing interest and letting them know that you were looking forward to, to hearing from them. So that's always uh, a great way to do it. And if you don't get any response from your email, your thank you email, or the email that says, I'm looking forward to hearing from you, wait another seven days and then call them. So that's that's what I would do. And if I if you're the Michael Seberger that I know you're a pretty senior guy, maybe you're not, maybe it's just coincidence. So in your case, it might be a little lengthier, but a week is still okay uh, if that if that helps. So it's really about the timing. It's about trying to get some kind of insight from them as to when they're going to call you. And it's about giving them just a couple of grace days if they don't honor it. But if they tell you nothing, seven days is the magic number. I hope that helped you. And if that did not, uh, hit me again in the questions. All right, Clive Fernando. Hey, Clive, how are you? When you specify to have 10 points, does it have to be 10 or can it be as little as five? Oops, sorry, I didn't, hopefully I wasn't banging your ears there. Uh, actually, I would make it double digits. Here is actually, and you know what, Clive? You are hitting on something that I think I flew by and did not mention in my little lesson there. One of the things that I wanted to say is what where people often miss is that they don't have enough reasons. So imagine if I asked you, and Clive, forgive me, I don't know what your, what your uh, function is, but if I asked you why you wanted to come and work with me at Mile Walk, and you said, well, I, you know, I, I, I got a call from your recruiter, and she asked me if I was interested, and I looked on your website, and it looked like you got a nice company, number one. Number two, it looked like the job was really something I'd be interested in. Number three, it, it just it doesn't sound like you really are really interested. I would rather you say, I have 10, because no one else, Clive, except the people on the 100 of you or 90 of you that are on this thing, will actually have 10 reasons. So number one, you're separating yourself. And trust me when I tell you, like I said, if you just go look at that happiness factor uh, blog post that I put out a couple of years ago, there's 12 of them right there. And you could just take those. You could just take those and use those if you want. But yes, I think you need to crush it. I mean, really slay it. And, and a lot of people are going to have three or five points. But if, if you say 10, they probably aren't even going to let you go through the whole list. But I think, I, think you need to be, I think you need to be that much better than everybody else. Because remember, and I don't know if you, if you were on the, the lesson last week when I talked about the tell me about yourself question and the fact that everybody that's interviewing when you go in for a job, Clive, and all of you on here, when you go in for a job interview, you're qualified. The employer says you're qualified because they've invited you in. So on paper, you're qualified. And they've also said the same thing to all the other candidates. So you have to look for every single opportunity that you have to separate yourself from them. And you're going to have 10 and they're going to have five. And that's, and that, I, would, I would try to go high. I would, I would really try to go high. So, and, and I've got the aids for you to do that. So you should, you should be able to use that. You might not be able to find in-depth research on every single one of them, but you would be amazed at what you could manufacture through your research and through some speculation that you could mention. So that's what I, uh, that's what I would do there. Okay, hang on guys, sorry, my list is a little long. Okay, Pamela Campbell, no question, cause you blew that up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Radisa. Hi, Andrew, have you ever actually heard the candidate respond like this? No, uh, I've never heard a candidate respond like this because candidates don't think this way. People who study job interviewing think this way. And uh, trust me when I tell you that 
everything that you do in the job interview has to be about selling yourself. And this is a way to sell yourself, share the information, and answer the question simultaneously. But just because no one's done it, and I don't hear people doing that uh, to me, or for me, or for my clients, doesn't mean it's not a great idea. And a lot of times, they answer it a little differently. They say, hey, you know, I researched you, and I discovered all these things about you that I thought were fascinating, and here they are. That's the same, that's the same answer. So I hope that helps, and I hope you're not discouraged because I'm not sure. Uh, so no, actually no. I do not hear a lot of people answer it this way, but this is how I would answer it. Jamie, strength and weakness question. Okay, so I'm assuming, Jamie, you're asking, what are your greatest strengths and what are your greatest weaknesses? So those are two different questions. So the one thing that I would do with your greatest strengths is before you go in, so the strengths first, before you any of you go into an interview, you need to look at the job description and in 90% of the cases, you're gonna have a job description. Your greatest strengths should be in alignment with what the job calls for. That's the golden answer. So the first thing that I would do is I wouldn't even care about what my greatest strengths are because your greatest strengths, just because you're great at them, does not necessarily mean the employer needs those particular strengths to do the job that they're looking to fulfill. And I talked about this last week with the tell me about yourself question. The error people make is they share about themselves what are their greatest strengths and the reason that that's a mistake is you first need to know what it is the employer needs in the job candidate to do the job well and align your strengths to what's in the job description. So I would highlight the strengths that match up to what's in the job description. That is what will get you hired. You may have a lot of additional strengths and what I would do is I would go through the three or four strongest or your strengths that align to the job description and then stop and then say, are there? would you like me to keep going? And then you can throw your other stuff in there if you want to. That's how I would answer the greatest strengths question. The greatest weakness question, you will love to hear that uh, maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago maybe, um, I, I created a video called how to answer the greatest weakness question. And so I would definitely check that one out you got a whole video there. So I, I'm not gonna go into that one as much because I, I recorded it, it's about uh, four or five minutes. I would check, I would check that one out. But it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a good one. All right, Lisette, hey Lisette. Hi Andrew, how do you negotiate the salary when there is a high and low number? So uh, I'm not, uh, Lisette, okay, great question about negotiating the salary. I'm not sure what you mean uh, if I'm assuming what you mean is you are in an interviewing process, you are aware that the employer has a salary range and they've shared it with you. And then you are going to go through the interviewing process and then you are going to negotiate knowing that it's, say, between you know 50,000 and 60,000 or something like that. If that's not correct, uh, please let me know. I'm just going to kind of keep an eye on this. Wait, now I see you. Okay, wait. Sorry. Okay, I got it. Uh, so that's what I assume that you mean. One thing that everybody, and I've talked about this, I think I get this question. I don't know if I've ever done a live cast of any kind, webinar or whatever, webcast or live stream, where somebody has not asked the salary question. And there are some staples with negotiating your salary that you need to be aware of. So let's just say you are aware of the salary range. Never negotiate the salary in the beginning of the process. You are welcome to share your current salary or earnings or bonuses or whatever you, you most recently were earning or currently earn. And if, if the employer asks you what you're, it's going to take or what you're interested in or what your salary preferences would be early on in the process, I would just say, I'm happy to provide my current compensation 
and I'm sure if we're right to e for each other, we'll be able to come to something amenable. But first, I need to really understand all the other things that go along with your working here at your organization. What I get to do, who I get to do it with, all the other benefits and my career development and all of that other stuff contributes to the value of for me in working here. So I don't know the exact salary number. You and go through the process and stick to that script. When you get to the end, when they ask you, okay, uh, we'd like to give you a job offer, then what, and if they say, what are you interested in? What's the number? Then what I would say is, well, based on how I performed in the interviewing process and the value you, you believe that I could bring to this organization, I would be open to hearing whatever offer you think is appropriate. Then let them put the number in front of you. Then look at that number and assess from there whether you want to negotiate. My default response is you should always look to negotiate unless they've really blown you away and given you a 20 or 40% pay increase and, and you know that that's really very generous of them. But I would look at that point at the end when your stock is the highest. So think in terms of as your interviewing process progresses, your their desire to hire you should grow it should grow every time you open your mouth every time you send a thank you email every time you send any kind of communication to them anytime you speak to them even when they think about you they should be happier and happier as time goes on because you they know more about you so they should want you more if if it goes down at any point that's bad and likely you won't get the job offer so at the end your stock is going to be the highest and your leverage is going to be the highest and then I would look to see what the offer is and then based on what the offer is and where it fit in those high and low ranges, I would determine ultimately what, I, what additionally I would ask for. And that's personal to you uh, and your situation and your job function and your, your overall situation as a, as a person and your financial well-being. So I hope that helps. But those are some, some, some principles. Okay, Michael, good, good, glad I hit that one for you, buddy. Mike Snyder. Mike Snyder asked, best way to overcome frequent short job stops seems to be a filter early on if you apply online. Okay, so Mike, there are two issues to uh, having these short job uh, stops or hops or whatever you want to call them. The first one is your resume uh, and them looking at them, looking at it and not even calling you because of it. The best way to overcome that is in your cover letter where you can give them some context around what the, you know, what the rationale is. Now, but I, I, I want to actually, I want to answer this. It, it's two pieces, but you can use one technique to diffuse it. I also, fortunately f for you, uh, I shot a video on the, it's on the YouTube channel and my blog called the best answer to the job hopper interview question. So assume you can get into the interviewing process and you have to deal with that question. The problem with being uh, or having these, these little hops is what most people do is they get tangled up trying to explain each particular reason why I went from this company to this company to this company to this company and the story drags out and you sound, I'm not saying you are a complainer, but in the interviewer's mind they think, oh geez, you know, nothing's ever going to be good with this guy. There's always going to be some problem and it won't be his or hers or whatever. So what I suggest in the job hopper video that I shot is that you make your your job hops or your stop your your frequent stops one issue that you have now solved so that you don't go in and explain each one of them so you you don't drag your answer out and interestingly enough it circles back to how I opened up this session when I talked about when they said hey why do you want to come and work for this for our company and when I said hey the person said okay I sat down and I identified 20 criteria and I have clarity around what I need to evaluate in order to make me happy one of the suggestions that I have in the job hopper video is you use that technique to diffuse all your issues so if you're sitting in front of somebody and they say 
hey, Mr. Lasavita, why do you have uh, four jobs in the last 10 years? I could say, you know what? Uh, each one of those was a unique situation, but I really did some evaluation and I discovered one thing that was common among all of them. All of them. Now I only have to answer one question instead of four. And the one thing that was common and that I've learned is that I was not thorough enough in my evaluation before I went into those jobs to make sure that over the long term those companies were going to make me happy. And I've discovered that now. So at this present moment, because what they really want you to answer, the question they really want you to answer is not why did you have those hops, the question is why is it going to be different this time? So you're gonna answer that question and the reason it's going to be different this time is because I identified these 20 criteria. I have much more clarity around what makes me happy. I'm gonna evaluate them throughout your process and that's how I'm gonna know whether or not this is really the right fit for me. Now, you could, if you wanted to, if you were really having trouble getting the job interviews, roll something like that into your cover letter. You can actually grant it if you're really struggling getting interviews. You can put something like that in your cover letter. I'm a less is more kind of guy in the cover letter, but you could do some things like that. So I hope I hope that gives you some ideas. I would also point you to that to that job hopper. If you just look at my YouTube channel and just search for job hopper or whatever, and there's 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 much more on that. But I hope I hope that helps. Uh, Jamie, again, toward the end of the interview, when asked, do you have any questions for me, what are the best questions to ask? Okay, I've got a bunch of questions for you. That is a fantastic question because I know everybody struggles with that. No matter what your unique situation, so in, in, in Mike Snyder's in Mike Snyder's case, he's got he's got some issues because of his his recent track record of a few different jobs, but you know, he might have to address that specific issue, but all of you need to ask good questions in a job interview. Now, one thing that I want to point you to, I mentioned this early in the in my intro, hopefully you caught that, uh, about three keys to ace any job interview. I have a webinar, it's a job interviewing webinar, and I teach you not only how to ask your questions, how to organize your questions, how to structure your sentences, how to group them, all that good stuff, but as a giveaway, there is a, an awesome ebook called How to Interview the Employer, 75 Great Questions to Ask Before You Take Any Job. So all of you can go watch that, in, that job uh, webinar, job interview webinar, and take that ebook. There's 75 questions, literally. We wrote them all out. We organized them for you. It is a, it is a beauty. So there's 75 right there. But you asked me, what are some great questions to ask? Here are my, say, top two favorite. The first one is, if you were to extend an offer and I was to accept it, after one year, what would I have specifically accomplished where you would consider this hire of me or the person, whoever you're going to hire, a raging success? And the reason I love that question is because this makes the interviewer be very, very clear on what the goals and objectives and specific accomplishments of the role are in his or her mind. Now, each, each interviewer, they might be a little different, but in his mind, this is what's really important. So then what you can do in turn is explain how you would accomplish those those goals, those those accomplishments, how specifically step by step would you do that? And I think you actually, Jamie, if I if I got it right, you asked me the question about the strengths and weaknesses. This is another way for you to reiterate your strengths and how your strong background aligns to what those activities are that are going to be necessary in order for you to achieve those accomplishments. That clarity puts you in alignment with what the interviewer thinks they need to evaluate in you. And now you could be very, very clear about how you would accomplish that. That is a home run question. You have to ask that question. The second question that I really like to ask is, if you were to give me an offer and I was to accept it, what is if I when I start, what is the first thing that will surprise me? So something that I didn't get in the interviewing process. And what I love about this is it usually it puts the interviewer on the spot. 
It makes him or her think about what would what surprised them. They give you that insight. They naturally think, although you didn't say it, they naturally migrate toward a negative surprise. That's just the way their mind works instead of a positive surprise. And they'll tell you something that you might not have otherwise asked and now you've surfaced more information. But they could have picked a good surprise too. They could have said, oh my God, you're gonna love the Friday happy hours or something that no one seems to ask about but everybody seems to love when they get here. But either way, those are two. I got 75 of them in that job interviewing webinar so I'd go watch that. All right, Shay Jose. Hey, Shay, Shay is a repeat uh, repeat attender. I remember you from last week. Uh, thank you for the, the claps. Hope all is well. Career changers, how to interview well or what should we focus on when you are changing careers and seeking employment in a new field, on a resume or in an interview? Okay, so actually, Shay, that is a super duper question and I'm gonna go you one better. I'm gonna go all the way back. Let's not even get to the resume and the job interview yet, which I'll cover, but let's go all the way back to thinking about the change itself. So I know some of you are struggling out there. You, you, you want to... You want, to, you want to change jobs. Actually, 70% of you would change jobs if you, if you could, right? Some of you feel like you're held hostage, you've been in it too long or whatever. So here's what I would do. There's four or five really good steps that you should take before you even consider the job change. The, going back to the first thing that I mentioned about how I would respond to the uh, why do you want to come here interview, or why do you want to come to our company? And I said, hey, I sat down. I thought of 20 things that or criteria that were really important for me to evaluate in a, in a current employer. That's the first thing that I would do. And I would write out that criteria, at least 20 of them, 30's better, 40's even better, but write it down and just do some deep soul searching. In fact, I have a wor free workshop that you could that you could uh, you could watch called the first five steps uh, for career success. These are the first first things that I would do. And I, I, would, I would list out all that criteria and I would make sure that you do some research on the new career to see if the new career and all the goods and all the bads that come along with it are gonna align to those things that make you happy. So you've gotta do some recon. Then what I would do is I would identify the skills and the traits and the capabilities and the other baseline uh, foundational abilities that go along with doing that job well and I would make sure that I personally had those skills so let's say for sake of argument there was some point in my career I was a I, I, I don't know that I wanted to, to go too much into my background I was an electrical engineering undergraduate student I got a degree in electrical engineering and I spent 18 years in information technology and management consulting before I became a recruiter 13 years ago well, at some point in those 18 years, I started to transition from being a technologist and a builder of concepts and solutions to becoming a seller of these solutions. So when I had to make that pivot or a career change or whatever, I had to make sure that the skills that I had or could grow were in alignment with what constituted a good salesperson, let's say, or a good marketing person. Leadership skills, listening skills, confidence, uh, being a good orator, making sure that you could help people understand and connect the dots for them as far as how what you bring to the table or your product or your service can solve what they're doing. So all these are foundational skills. You might have already, whatever your uh, career change is going to be, you might have already started to grow these things. And so you want to pay close attention to them. So that's item number three. And then item number four is I would go and I would talk to people who currently do that job to see what they're going to. And I, and I stress the word currently doing that job. Don't, it's not as powerful to talk to somebody who has done that job because if they're not currently doing it at the moment, if they're not living it, then they forget what it was like. They forget the issues that they were facing. They might remember some, but you forget a lot. It, 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 trust me. So somebody who's currently in the role is the best person to ask. Those are like the four or five things that I would do before I even put the resume together or started job interviewing. Then once I went through that, if I, I would make sure that that's what I want to do. And then I would take 
the capabilities, the abilities, and those particular uh, skills or foundational traits that I identified. So in the example that I provided you, when I was moving to become more of a salesperson, then what I did was I said, okay, leadership, uh, confidence, uh, organizational skill, you know, all those, all those things. And I started to highlight those, or you could highlight those on your resume for whatever yours are. So your resume should be filled with highlights and accomplishments related to building the foundational traits that the new career calls for. Now, employers who are really savvy, that's what they look for. Now, a lot of them overemphasize the, part, the specific experience in that role or market or industry or job or whatever, but the really good employers know better because over the long term, those skills, the trade can be trained for. The foundational abilities, which are either part of your DNA or you've built over time, are much harder to train for. They're not, te they're not as teachable. So those are things that you have to self-develop. And so that's, that's more important. So I would highlight that. Then when you get into the job interview, so you asked about the job interview, those would be the things I would stress. So I think uh, Jamie asked about the strength and weaknesses questions, and let's say you get that too. You want to start aligning the foundational capabilities that you built and call them your strengths, and that's how they map to being a good whatever. So in my case, uh, when I was looking at you know getting promoted into these sales areas or whatever it was, you know, I would highlight my uh, communication skills, my influential skills, my organizational and administration skills, my coaching and mentoring, my consultative, my client relationship building skills, and so on, even though I hadn't done that job yet. So that's what you need to do. So I hope that helps. So just to recap, that, that was a big one. Uh, make sure it's the right career. Go through the steps. There's a workshop out there called The First Five Steps to Career Success. It's on the Mile Walk Academy. Go watch its three videos. And then, uh, and then on the resume, I would bring forward into the top. If you, Shay, if you've seen my how to build your ultimate professional resume video, it's free and I give a, a resume template with that. Up at the top in the career profile and in the highlights section, you want to bring those capabilities way up so that they see them front and center. And then when you get in the job interview, you want to stress them. Hope that helps. All right, Diane. Diane Basson. How do you interview for a new career area and you're over 50? How do you apply when you only have training in your new area? Okay, Diane, I'm assuming, hopefully, you just heard everything I said to Shay. Uh, it doesn't matter that you're over 50. Uh, I would do the same exact stuff that I just outlined. Make sure it's the right career, uh, uh, alter your resume, alter your resume, and in the job interview, you wanna highlight that stuff, and when you apply, if you were applying, one thing I didn't mention in Shays, but, but Diane, I'll pick it up here for you. In your cover letter, you could stress your cover letter, people, cover letters that, or the email intro or whatever you're going to use, the, the notes section in the applicant tracking system, you get to say whatever you want. You get to blueprint that thing. How awesome is that? No one gets to tell you what to put in there. So put in how you have all these capabilities and how you are making this. I, not only do I have the foundational capabilities, but I've been, in Diane's case, trained in the area. Add that in there. I have training and certifications and things I went to and whatever, and that's positioned me well for uh, my new job. We had actually, uh, there was one student of mine in my resume uh, course. I have a resume course and a workshop, and she is, uh, I'm 50, she's about my age, so our age, let's say. And she uh, she had just studied and gone to paralegal school. But a lot of her recent work history was not, was legal secretary, legal administrator, and so forth. So but we were very easily able to highlight all that good stuff, put her training and her schooling and her foundational traits in her career profile and highlight section of her resume and uh, off we went. So that's something, um, that's something that, uh, that, that I would do. And if, you're, if you can't pick it up from all the free stuff I put out there, check out that resume course. Uh, I have a resume course, folks, and a live workshop. That live workshop is June 14th. Uh, if you wanna attend the live session with me, it's, it's kinda like this, although I go through all the details of building the sweet resume. And, and there's a lot of people, Diane, like you, and like Shay, and folks that want to make changes, uh, career changes. So 
take me up on that. Hey, Michael, yep, awesome, awesome. Lisette is, whoop, sorry, I see a couple more coming in. Lisette, okay, yeah, yes, you got it, it's arranged. Thanks for the salary response. Lisette, you are welcome. David, hey, buddy, Andy, I thought you said not to actually give a strength or weakness, but instead talk about something. Okay, okay, wait, I'm gonna reread this, and I know what David is asking. So David is asking, uh, he said, Andy, I thought you said not to actually give a strength or weakness, but instead talk about something you haven't had the opportunity to do and what steps you are taking to get to that opportunity. Okay, so David, uh, hope, you're, hope you're still here with me. Here's the, here's the clarification. Jamie asked, he said strengths and weakness questions or question. So I answered the strength question for him and I referred him to the greatest weakness video for the greatest weakness answer. But for everybody who has not seen that video, what David is referring to is whenever you are, so let's pick this up right now. Whenever you are asked what your greatest weakness is, there's a couple things you don't do and one thing you should do. So I'll give you a short answer and a preview into what's in that video. You never, ever, ever, ever give them an actual weakness. It's a stupid question. They shouldn't even be asking it. And you don't need to dignify it with a response that says, okay, well, I'm actually bad at this. I'm not, I'm always late. I'm unorganized. I'm whatever. Don't, don't ever give them that. You can't control the, the questions they ask you, but you can control your response. That's number one. Number two, and what David is, is referencing here is, I don't ever want you to give them a strength either. So don't say, you know, uh, I'm too detail oriented or I'm, I'm, I'm so awesome. I do everything myself and I don't delegate well. That's what I'm talking about. So when you're asked the greatest weakness question, don't give an actual strength. The best way to approach it is to highlight something, preferably something that is not related to the job description that you might be interested in doing and talk about how you haven't yet had an opportunity to do that so you're inexperienced because you haven't done it yet. That's what I was talking about. So David, I hope that helps for everybody else to cl just to clarify that's what it is. Mike Snyder, you are welcome for the job hopping answer. Nicole, hey Nicole. Uh, Nicole asks, how do you present contract work as a strength when you are trying to gain a permanent role at a company? Oh. That's awesome. Okay, so Nicole, uh, there are some assumptions that I need to make in answering this. Uh, for all you contractors out there, if you are have been a contractor for a lengthy period of time, I, I suggest on the resume that you aggregate that work and you call it Nicole uh, Bovell or Bovell uh, Inc. or LLP or LLC or whatever you are, uh, incorporated or sole proprietor, and you group the types of activities that you've done, and then you group the clients that you've done them for and all that good stuff. So you know, from 2010 to 2017, I was Nicole Inc and here's all I'm doing. Many employers understand if you simply explain, you, you obviously are looking for a permanent role and you can say, I love what I'm doing, I'm a great technologist or project manager or whatever it is that you are, business analyst or whatever, I love that, but I'm really looking for a home. And, and one, of the, one of the issues that I face now is obviously I have to market myself at each job and I really would like to find a home. That's a very, very understandable explanation if that's in fact why you wanna, you know, you might need benefits, you might, there might be a whole host of reasons, I don't know what those are. But I, I don't, I would not be concerned that you've been a contractor and that they're gonna be concerned that you've been a contractor for a while and not want to hire you as a, as a full-time employer. So your strengths have more to do with the skills that you've gained, and you want to highlight those in uh, on your resume by showing wh what you've built and what skills you've built and where you've built them. And you can also highlight that in your cover letter and on your LinkedIn profile. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about that. I hope I hope that answered your question. If not, hit me again, or if we run out of time, which we're gonna in about five minutes, then then you can certainly go in the comments on this uh, live stream. Okay, Leo, hey Leo, 
hey Andrew, this is a company that I would like to really work for. Would it be okay to send my cover letter and resume to a hiring manager even if there aren't any job openings? Leo, my man, yes, always. For all of you out there, send them, send them. There is no reason for you ever not to send a resume and a cover letter to a company you wanna work for, ever, ever. So you want that job, you send it. I don't, care what the, I don't care what the career portal says, I don't care what the recruiter says, I don't care what the HR person says, I don't care, send it. You send a nice, thoughtful email with your cover letter and your resume, and you tell them why you wanna work there, and if there's an opening, great. If there's not, keep me in mind or whatever. And I'll go you one better, Leo. I've got a video out there uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cover letter tip and it's called uh, how to boss hunt with a cover letter that makes hearts melt. You can use that tactic and there are two sample cover letters in a little packet that I send you. In the, it's in the description. Watch the video, it's like five, five, six, seven minutes. And in there, you take the download and there's two cover letters. And those cover letters are designed to send to an individual that you wanna talk to or meet. And even if that's not the exact boss, even if it's a higher up in the organization, you can massage the cover letters to accommodate whether they have a job or whether they don't have a job that you can find. Actually, those cover letters are designed, I literally wrote one if you knew there was a job and one if you didn't know if there was a job. So take those. Okay, Albert, oops, sorry, guys are. Albert, hi, I just got home and clicked on the link. Hi, Andrew, good videos. Thank you, buddy, glad to have you. Rob Zelinka. Rob is a repeat attender, I love it. How do you recommend dealing with incompetent recruiters or worse yet, a recruiter with questionable integrity? Oof. Understanding, of course, they are your window into the employer. Rob, that's a great question. And everybody, this is a, this is a rough one because you know, I call them gatekeepers. You can call them whatever you want. They're obstacles and thorns. Uh, but what I would do is I would, here again, you can only control what you can control, which is how you respond, which hopefully Rob is always positive, always upbeat, always courteous to them, even if they're not, you know, really on it or sharp. Uh, there's different there's different issues with uh, with with the, the integrity is is one issue. The the incompetency is another, or just being obstinate is another. But candidly without knowing the exact situation I'm I'm always about what I can control which is my attitude my thoughts my message to them which is always upbeat and positive and the other thing that you can do if you if you're inclined is and I would go back to uh, to Leo here and you know maybe you send a message directly to the hiring official if you don't if you know you're not going to have egg on your face and maybe you don't want to circumvent the process but you might want to find, you know, I would look all over the place to see if I had some kind of relationship to that hiring official, or whatever. But uh, but I hope I hope that helps. I know it's a little hard because I'm not sure of the exact situation. But you can also comment in the notes if you want to tell me some more, or I mean in the comment section. Jenny is here. Okay, uh, Jenny. Hi, Andrew. What happened when you have to fill an application form with the last two references? of my two direct managers, but if you had left because your boss was not the best and inspirational one, how can I manage and arrange this situation with the interview? Okay, so in Jenny's case, that's a great question. These are all great questions, but in, in Jenny's case, oftentimes, in most cases, you should not have to give uh, your direct managers, especially if you are still working at the company. So most uh, organizations on the application, if they ask you for your direct references, I would always say, if, if possible, I, I do not want to give my reference because I'm currently working there, or even if you just left, I would probably say that. Uh, if, if you got to go back to managers, uh, I would I would probably try to find somebody else in the organization that you worked with that could serve as a reference. 
Uh, typically, companies don't even do these references. They're not very valuable. I understand companies are trying to get around the fact that you would otherwise provide three people who would speak glowingly about you. And what they're trying to do is just find, you know, find your bosses and see what your bosses would say. But you know, I'm okay if you if you dodge that a little bit. I really am because I, I don't think it's fair for them to ask you for your direct bosses, especially if you're still working. I don't know that that was the best answer, but that's what I would do. Shay, thank you. Awesome advice. I'm currently a dog groomer. Shay, I love dogs. And for any of you that follow me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, you know my fur babies are my life. Uh, okay, so Shay says, thank you, awesome advice. I'm currently a dog groomer, 10 years, and I'm in school for RN nursing now. Your videos are the best. Thanks again. You are welcome, Shay. David, I am great. That was you. Okay, hang on. I'm trying to just get through. Diane, that was me. Awesome. Nicole, yes, thank you. You're welcome. George or Jorge, hello, Andrew. I appreciate the webcast. One question. How do I hint to an interviewer that I have other job offers, especially in the same feeling? So uh, George or Jorge, however you pronounce that, uh, you don't need to hint, you can just come out and tell them. So uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer the question at the top level and then maybe for you specifically. Folks, it is okay, and not, not, not just okay, but appropriate, and ethical for you to share what other activity you have going. It is kind, you can do it politely, and you could do it in a manner that says, I just want to be upfront with you, Mr. Employer, that I'm also interviewing with some other companies. I'm interviewing with, it sounds like you have multiple offers, so let's just say I'm interviewing with two other companies, and here's where I am in the overall stage, and here's the positions that I'm interviewing for. And there's nothing wrong that you're interviewing with probably competitors that would make sense, right? So you could say, I'm interviewing for, I don't know what your position is, but you know a technology position or an engineer position, and I'm in the third round of what I think are four rounds, and I'm, I just wanna let you know, and I will keep you apprised along the way. That's it, you're not threatening them, you're just sharing the information. So that's what I would do, and I would just let them know. Then if you get an offer, I would email the HR person or the recruiter or whoever is your contact and I would say, I just want to let you know I did receive an offer. I and and then then you need to figure out what you want to do. If you want one of the offers and you want to take it, then just say I'm out. If you want to see what this company has to offer that does you don't have the offer yet, then what I would say is I they've given me however long they've given you, one week or two weeks or one day or whatever it is. Some companies are crazy sometimes to respond. So I just wanted you to know, and is there anything, any update you can provide on your end? I just want to make sure that I'm being thoughtful to all the parties that are involved. That's it. I would not, you do not need to apologize. You do not need to hide it. Be upfront. That's always your best answer. Always the best response. David, Andy, another question. Are you a fan of having both a master resume and a resume that is targeted for a specific job? or should you just tailor your resume for the job you are applying for? So David, here are my preferences in order of preference. One resume. One resume that you design that you can use to target everything. That's my first preference. My second preference is one resume that only needs to be mildly altered for other types of positions. And then what you can also do there is a uh, there is a website called Job Scan J O B S C A N. If you all go to Job Scan, for those of you that are applying online, never submit your resume without job scanning it first. So if you are applying online, uh, in situations where you have a job description. Sometimes you apply online and you don't have a specific job description. You can take, you can cut out the job description, put it in job scan, put your resume in job scan, and it will tell you uh, the degree of match to your resume to that job. And then you can make some alterations and tighten it up so that just from a keyword perspective and a skills perspective and so on, you're aligning to that particular uh, job in that company. It's really cool, and I, I think we've had, I've never used it before, but we have, we have a number of people, uh, we talk about this on my monthly coaching uh, call, 
that and in the resume workshop that where we're we're going through this and, and the resume is a heavy issue for people but it's really really helpful okay i see we are up here on noon so i'm going to take a couple more of these and then we're going to jump off um oh my god troll monster that <laughs> okay wait i gotta read this troll monster 13 says what happens if you fart during the interview say excuse me okay Shea Jose, you have to have a part two of these questions that's coming through your ass, and thank you. You know, people, you know I have a YouTube channel. You're on it. All those videos have a comment section. I respond to every single question that I get. I try to do it in 24 hours, but usually it's within 24, but not always. But I respond to every question to anybody that needs help, and that's my promise. And if you don't believe me, you can comb my whole channel, and you could look, and I've responded. As long as your question is polite and you need help, I will respond to you. Albert said, is it good to say that you want to work for that company because of the benefits they offer? Please guide to the best answer. So Albert, in most cases, that's a great question. In most cases, you won't actually know the benefits that they, if, if you're talking about medical, dental, vacation, and 401k and those kind of things, you won't know those benefits when they ask that question, which is usually going to be up front. When you are down to the end, as they start to put that stuff in front of you, as you get that offer, it's okay to say that, that, that this is a big part of what would attract me you know, you're good to your employees. You got a great benefits package. Okay, we've got Nagam. I think that's how you pronounce it. I want to work in international relations. Everything I do right now is far away from it, like working in sales, handicraft works, coaching, because every time I apply for a job like this, I get refused. So Nagam, I would go back to uh, what I mentioned to, I think it was Shay. Uh, I think it was Shay earlier about when she asked about changing careers. And I would follow that, and hopefully you were here for that. And if you were not here for that, uh, this, by the way, folks, when YouTube records this automatically, and uh, I put it up on my YouTube channel, and you can go back, and you can you can re rewind it, replay it. I'll probably trim out all that front stuff that we had problems with, but it'll, it'll, it'll be there for you. Leo, you are welcome. Jorge, thank you. Beautiful. Should it be volunteered in the beginning of the interview? Actually, wait, let me go back and see. Yes. Okay. So what uh, what George or Jorge is asking is, should he volunteer in the beginning of the interview that he is uh, interviewing with other companies or has a job interview? Folks, that's a fantastic question. What you should do uh, usually, early in the process, you're meeting with an HR or recruiter or the hiring official or somebody that's your leadoff hitter. With your leadoff hitter, you want to tell them right away, I'm interviewing with other companies and I will be happy to share with you my updates and my status with those throughout the process. That's what I would do. And then anytime you have updates that are material that they should know about you should send them that is that insight and if something happens and then you happen to go right into a job interview i would let that i would let those people know yes volunteer and david said he uses job scan but it founds that he tends to repeat the same keywords in different ways though that might be true for sure okay folks i uh i'm i'm a little over well actually i'm 27 minutes over my intended uh time or 22 minutes but I hope you've had fun. I'm super sorry about the technical difficulties initially. I, had, I think I had a glitch here and something wasn't plugged in properly. But thank you for hanging in there. I know a lot of you stayed. There's like 80 people now. I mean, that's great. I hope uh, if, you, uh, if you want more of this, just watch the replay. I've got loads of stuff on the YouTube channel and the Tips for Work and Life blog. I've got tons of downloads for you. I got a lot of help with resume writing, job interviewing, and so on, so grab all that stuff. And if you are not subscribed to this channel, subscribe, and you will get the alerts. I'm gonna be here next week, Thursday, 11 Central, so make sure you're subscribed so you get the, the notifications. And until next week, have a great one. Good luck in your search.